You have my sword. And you have my bow. And my axe. And my takes. I'm sorry, you don't need my takes, Frodo. Everyone brings something to the table here in the Fellowship, but it is Boromir's words I'm most interested in. Take it away, Boromir. You carry the fate of us all, little one. If this is indeed the will of the Council, then Gondor will see it done. Ah, he says the fates of us all, not the fate of us all, like the shared success or failure of us all collectively, but an implication that they will each suffer separate fates, because Boromir fears the Fellowship will fail. But despite the Fellowship's fracture in this film, it lives on. In the world of Tolkien, it's impossible for Fellowship as a concept to fail. While rings are forged, Fellowship is a gift from the Valar. I'm Eric Voss, and this is The Deep Dive, a channel that dives deep into the films we love, and Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy is a masterful adaptation of J.R.R. Tolkien's work, with so much scholarly wisdom poured out over this film on the internet already that one does not simply make a Lord of the Rings video analysis on YouTube, but here at the end of year one of the Deep Dive channel, it must be done. Join me on a journey through the leitmotifs of the all-time best film score by Howard Shore, the gorgeous design of Middle Earth, and the powerful themes of friendship and fellowship despite the darkness that binds us. Part one of our three-part Deep Dive series of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, 2001 ones, The Fellowship of the Ring. And note that I will be breaking down Peter Jackson's extended editions of each of these films because why the hell wouldn't I do it the right way? Okay, over black, we hear a choir of voices. These sung notes are Howard Shore's Lothlorien theme, the music of Galadriel. The prologue narration was originally written for Frodo and then for Gandalf, but while Elijah Wood and Ian McKellen recorded these lines, since neither of these characters were present for this history, it was assigned to Kate Blanchett as Galadriel. An opening with these singers frames this history as a kind of cautionary tale coming from the elves of Lothlorien. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings is, among many things, a story about stories. Stories power to reframe the past and to dictate the future, Galadriel shares wisdom from someone not even present at the Council of Elrond, something that all of these men, these dwarves, these elves, these Istari, and these hobbits miss. And that wisdom is really the correct words to properly convey a palpable sensory dread. The world is changed. Before we even hear Galadriel in our language, we hear the Elvish translation, indicating to the viewer that all of this is being translated from the Elvish language. As a linguist, Tolkien populated his world with original languages that he created, and Peter Jackson, his partner Fran Walsh, and their co-writer Philip Aboyans often went back to the source material for this specificity. And this attention to detail is one of many things that makes this film series amazing. Galadriel says, I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth, I smell it in the air. Much of once was is lost, for none now live who remember it. What was lost, that Galadriel says, none live to remember, I believe is what Galadriel believes is the concept of fellowship, a God-given calling to help each other at our own expense. Elves in Tolkien's mythology do not age. They were brought to the world by the gods of Valar, and they watch the centuries go by as mortal men go to war with each other, and they just witness and decide when to intervene. When they decide their time in this world comes to an end, they sail west to the undying lands of the Valinor. It is this blessing that Sauron envied the most about the elves, as a Maya tasked with serving the Valar, but not one of them. Upon the defeat of Morgoth at the end of the first stage in the events of the Silmarillion, his lieutenant Sauron escaped and tricked the leaders of Middle-earth during the second age as Anatar, the bringer of gifts, a history that's now being explored in Amazon Prime videos, The Rings of Power, but I won't be focusing much on that series in these analyses. Howard Shore's Lothlorien theme gives way to his ring theme on strings as the series title fades in. Nine notes there. Howard Shore loves to use nine notes. Nine Nazgul, and their theme has nine notes to it, for their nine rings that were given to men, nine members of the Fellowship to destroy the One Ring. And notice how these nine notes do not end in any kind of resolution. They just kind of leave off in a way that forces you to code it back to the beginning and repeat it again and again and again, like a ring. It never ends. Galadriel explains that three rings were given to the elves. These rings were named Vilya, Nenya, and Narya, and these rings were given to 
to Gil Galad, who entrusted them to Elrond, to Círdan, and to Galadriel. They were forged by Sauron and the elf smith Celebrimbor, who forged the Door of Durin. Gil Galad was played by Mark Ferguson in this movie, whose scenes were cut, but he does make a cameo here in the Three Rings shot and during the battle briefly. Seven rings were given to the Dwarf Lords. Actually, some of these dwarfs in the shot were played by artists from Weta, prosthetic supervisor Gino Acevedo, foam tech Xander Forchery, and prosthetics tech Rich Mayberry. And nine rings were given to men who suck. But you know, it's not their fault. Now, in Tolkien's text, the elves forged their three rings themselves and gave them no powers of domination, and Sauron could only see their thoughts through the rings so they could take them off and cut off the link. The dwarf rings made them wealthy, but also made them greedy. But since men seek power over all else, their ambitions destroyed them. Actually, artist Alan Lee cameos as one of the human kings over on the far right there. More on him in a second. Meanwhile, artist John Howe appears as one of the kings on the other side. He's the bearded one who holds the ring as if it disgusts him. We see this gorgeous map of Middle Earth. The cartography and calligraphy for these films were rendered by artist Daniel Reeve, but many of the original maps for Tolkien's Middle Earth were sketched by Tolkien's son, Christopher Tolkien. And we see the Siege of Barad-dûr at the end of the Second Age, following the Battle of Daggerlad, showing the last alliance under the elf lord Gil-galad and the human Elendil from Numenor. Special effects artist Stephen Regulus developed an elaborate CGI system called Massive to create thousands of individual animated characters. In this wide shot, in the foreground, you can see individual warriors falling to elf arrows, while in the distance, they color code the armies with the elves in golden armor, Sauron's forces in black, and the forces of men in gray armor with gold leaf. Much of this armor and other designs were overseen by renowned Tolkien concept artists Alan Lee and John Howe. Lee had illustrated the 1992 editions of Lord of the Rings, among many other works, and Howe designed the maps for Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and The Silmarillion. You need these guys on the team to do it properly. This battle includes little details to give it specificity that I always love, like Elrond, played by Hugo Weaving, Gilgalad's lieutenant. The arrows brush his hair ever so slightly as they loose inches from his cheek. We feel like we are in the battle with them. Now, Peter, Fran, and Philippa could have had Hugo Weaving narrate this whole prologue as Elrond. He would have been a recognizable voice to viewers at this point as Agent Smith. But remember, these films were being produced before The Matrix was released. And since we get Elrond's part of this story later on, this prologue is presented as a sort of objective account of what these participants failed to see. Overall, Lord of the Rings is not Elrond's story. He is as futile as everyone else is. Sauron, armed with the One Ring, single-handedly clears elves with swipes lit with flashes of white. Now you'll notice Peter Jackson colors this scene with high contrast and sharp focus because the goal isn't gritty realism. It's meant to be a stylized storybook prologue and it results in these visuals holding up decades later. Sauron's giant armored appearance was actually based on Tolkien's descriptions of Morgoth, Sauron's superior, who died at the end of the first stage. Sauron had otherwise been described as kind of a shapeshifter who has appeared as an animal, but in other instances, quote, a man of more than human stature and quote, an image of malice and hatred made visible. Elendil charges in and Sauron kills him. His sword, Narsil, falls. Elendil's son, Isildur, grabs it. Sauron stomps on it to break it, creating the instrument of his own defeat. Isildur severs Sauron's fingers with the broken blade, freeing the ring, and Sauron's corporeal form explodes, releasing a shockwave, which was some creative license by Peter Jackson. While separating the ring from the rest of him would do some damage, Jackson really considered this to be Sauron escaping. And I like the idea of the shockwave, suggesting that he could have gone anywhere in a 360 degree direction, potentially even into the hearts of all of the living survivors, any of us, so long as the One Ring survives. It's not enough to vanquish the current vessel of evil, we must purge it from our own hearts. Isildur holds the ring in his palm, and Galadriel says, But the hearts of men are easily corrupted, and the Ring of Power has a will of its own. Galadriel and Elrond's accounts of this history are pretty unfair to Isildur and to all of mankind. The truth is, any elf or any dwarf who held this ring in their hand probably would have made the same selfish choice. Isildur dies in the River Anduin as the ring flees his hand. Tolkien actually wrote two accounts of Isildur's death, one in Of the Rings of Power and the Third Age at the end of the Silmarillion, told from the point of view of the Eldar, which stated that Isildur left his camp unguarded and it was his own selfish fault. But this death is adapted from Tolkien's Unfinished Tales, in which Isildur fully Foolishly took a less safe riverside route and got ambushed by orcs. He tried to flee in the river, but the ring loosened from his finger and he got hit with a poisoned arrow. Either way, Isildur dies in the water, which is befitting as a fate of a Numenorian whose island home of Numenor sunk into the sea during the previous age. Galadriel repeats, And some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. 
The greatest crime, she suggests, is forgetting history. The guilt there rests with the elves, who were the ageless ones who were there to witness it all. Andy Circus plays Gollum, but only in a few appearances here in the first film. Circus created the Gollum voice by drinking a special mixture to produce mucus in his throat, and he said that he impersonated his cat copying up furballs. In this scene, notice how he rolls his R on precious, a cat purr-like flourish that he doesn't always bring back into Towers in Return of the King. You can see fish bones in the foreground of this misty mountain cavern, and I love how the moonlight is briefly caught in his eyes. But the physical work for the shot actually was not done by Andy Serkis because he hadn't been cast yet. When they shot it, Dominic Monaghan stood in for him, which might be why he looks at this ring like it's a paint. The events of The Hobbit are teased as Bilbo discovers the ring and pockets it. Ian Holm made it look younger with a wig and makeup. And with Bilbo, we transition to the Shire, as Howard Shore's Shire the plays as a leitmotif. This makes it a handoff from Galadriel's history to Bilbo's history, as we realize these maps are actually part of his tome. He could not write a word until he properly drew the map of his unexpected journey. So this prologue really begins as a cautionary tale from elves and it kind of dissolves into a call to adventure from a hobbit. Here in the extended edition, we get the title reveal with Shore's fellowship leitmotif here in Bag End. Bilbo writes there and back again, a hobbit's tale, and he turns the page to find it blank. A story about stories. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings follows Joseph Campbell's monomyth structure in which heroes venture out into the unknown and circle back home. The return is a critical step for all stories because it's the only way to prove that the hero has truly changed and wizened. Bilbo titles his first section Concerning Hobbits, which is a title of Tolkien's prologue for The Fellowship of the Ring. Much of Bilbo's descriptions are lifted directly from Tolkien's text. Concerning Hobbits was originally shot to be a replacement introduction to the film as Peter Jackson feared that the prologue recapping the events of the Second Age was too much of an info dump, but he stuck with his original plan and included Concerning Hobbits for this extended edition. Ian Holmes' voice is actually a welcome one to introduce us to the Shire. He was the voice of Frodo Baggins in the 1981 BBC radio adaptation of The Lord of the Rings. The town of Hobbiton was built into the hills of a farm near the town of Matamata in Waikato, New Zealand. The film's crew took over a year to make it a natural, lived-in location with real vegetable patches, grass grown to the proper height by having sheep eat it. Actually, we get this shot of Samwise Gamgee planting flowers, and this would be the only time in the trilogy we actually see Sam gardening, as he is a Baggins' gardener. As Bill Bilbo says, For all hobbits share a love of things that grow. Establishing an affinity for plant life that Merry and Pippin will build on to broker an alliance with the Ents. And Bilbo says, It is brought home to me. It is no bad thing to celebrate a simple life. These opening minutes do such a good job, painting the Shire as a place we would never want to leave. A warm abode that we'll never forget over the 10 hours of trilogy runtime and always, always long to get back to. Frodo Baggins, played in this movie by Elijah Wood, hears Gandalf humming a song. The road goes ever on and on comes from Tolkien directly, like all the songs do. This is actually a song Gandalf learned from Bilbo, and it shows how excited Gandalf is to see his friend again. We actually hear Bilbo singing it as he walks off. And actually, in the book, Frodo sings it early on in his journey, but he changes the words to pursuing it with eager feet, but then he later changes it back to pursuing it with weary feet. Now, to make the actors who play hobbits look smaller than the men and the other races, Peter Jackson used a mix of classic techniques like body doubles, forced perspective, etc., as well as things like, you know, digitally mapping in actors' faces and bodies in a few instances. This shot of Frodo running up to the ledge, Frodo seen from behind, was actually Elijah Wood's double, Kieran Shaw. In the behind the scenes documentary, you can see Elijah teaching Kieran how to strike the pose with his arms crossed properly. Gandalf tells Frodo, A wizard is never late, Frodo Baggins. Nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. So Istari, aka wizards, are indeed something close to ageless beings for whom time has less meaning. And an argument could be made that Gandalf appears precisely when he is needed throughout the story, like with the dawn of the sun at Helm's Deep. Ian McKellen, somehow the only actor in this trilogy to be nominated for an Oscar for their role, based Gandalf's accent on the particular voice of J.R.R. Tolkien himself, which sometimes is a bit hard for people to understand because he's just so old and wise and mumbly. No, I don't desire to go and have afternoons talking elvish to chaps. In the shot of Elijah Wood jumping into 
to Gandalf's arms, Gandalf was actually, for this shot, Paul Randall, a seven foot tall policeman from New Zealand whom they nicknamed Tall Paul. And then the two shot of them, supposedly side by side, Elijah is actually sitting three feet behind Ian McKellen. They had to cheat their eye lines, so really Elijah's looking far behind Ian's head. This is how forced perspective works, and it works perfectly here. Every time you see characters sitting at a table while one is pouring the other tea, they are actually not at all looking at each other. And Peter Jackson's camera crew devised a pulley and a platform so that when the camera would move in these forced perspective shots, rather than it completely screwing up the angle, the cameras also move, and that way it doesn't disrupt the illusion. Now, Bilbo panics for a moment when he thinks he's lost the ring, but then finds it in his pocket. <sighs> Yes, that purr that Ian Holm lets out almost sounds like the cat purr of Gollum. Gandalf enters bag end, and to pull this off, they built two identical sets, just one large size for hobbits, and then another 33% smaller for Ian McKellen to bump into stuff. Even all the books on the shelves are exactly 33% smaller. And apparently the shot of Ian McKellen hitting his head on the post was not planned. The two portraits over the fireplace are based on the likenesses of Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh. Meanwhile, Bilbo says, Yes, this comes from a line in The Hobbit when Gandalf tells Bilbo to bring out the cold chicken and pickles. The map that Gandalf finds depicts Erebor, the lonely mountain, and mentions the desolation of Smaug. Of course, all details from The Hobbit, because while making this movie, Peter Jackson and his team were adapting both the text of The Lord of the Rings and the text of The Hobbit prelude story. Really, they had all of Tolkien's writings that they fed into this movie. So Bilbo grumbles about the Sackville Bagginses knocking on the door. These are cousins from the book who keep pestering for the estate and they hate when Bilbo leaves it to Frodo. Gandalf says Frodo has noticed Bilbo's odd behavior as of late. Of course he does. He's a Baggins, not some block-headed brace girdle from Hardbottle. Yes, so Lobelia Sackville Baggins, who was just at the door and shows up later, was born a brace girdle from Hardbottle, according to the text. Bilbo looks haunted as he says. I feel thin, sort of stretched, like butter scraped over too much bread. And I don't expect I shall return. In fact, I mean not to. The tragedy of Bilbo. The real sadness of Bilbo is that it's not his idle years in the Shire that make him feel so stretched out. It is the ring that is festering in his pocket. That is what made him itch in the Shire. At Bilbo's 111th birthday party, Pippin actually makes his first appearance on the stage, playing with the other musicians. Bilbo tells a story to a group of young hobbits. These actually include Peter Jackson's children, Billy Jackson and Katie Jackson, talking about his encounter with these three trolls who get turned to stone. Of course, also from the Hobbit, we'll actually run into these stone trolls later, Merry and Pippin steal Gandalf's biggest firework and set it off inside a tent. Yeah, apparently that scream was Billy Boyd's actual scream when the pyrotechnic went off. The dragon swoops overhead and Frodo worries about Bilbo because he knows that he went through an experience with the dragon, Smaug, and doesn't want to give the old man a heart attack. And notice how it catches fire one of the tents. And I love this detail because it means the crew had to practically light this on fire, timing it with the visual effect that they would add in later. Bilbo shouts out all the families who are at the party. Yeah, this shot with the feet in the close-up is an homage to Ralph Bakshi's 1978 animated Lord of the Rings, which was obviously a huge influence on Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson also mirrored Bakshi's framing of the four hobbits hiding under the root as the Nazgul lean over them, and the Nazgul circling the hobbits at Weathertop. So whatever era of Lord of the Rings you grew up with, you're gonna find some element of it in this movie. It's really a full celebration of the full Lord of the Rings history up until this point. Now, remember Proudfoot was the hobbit who scowled at Gandalf earlier, and he's acknowledging that there's proud feet. Like, there's a ton of kids in this family. They are the ones who chased after Gandalf's cart and got that little preview of the fireworks. But then Bilbo confuses everyone, and I love this line. I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. Yeah, this is a line directly from Tolkien's text, and it goes so fast we can't really even process it, but when you break it down, it's actually pretty tragic. Bilbo is drunkenly, yet honestly, admitting that his past adventures changed him and gave him little in common with the others of the Shire, making it so that he had no one to share these deep conversations with. He's saying that they deserve to be liked, that there's nothing wrong with a simple life, but that he is the one who's wrong, who doesn't fit in. He's explaining to them why he has to leave. Now, we do not need to see Gollum much on screen in Fellowship because Ian Holm, displays the dualism frighteningly as Bilbo. I think you should leave the ring behind, Bilbo. Is that so hard? Well, no. And yes. Gandalf hears him whisper the word precious and remembers Gollum. Bilbo accuses Gandalf of wanting the ring for himself. Bilbo Baggins, do not take me for some conjurer of cheap tricks. 
Gandalf uses magic to scare him straight. But we can also liken this with Galadriel's scary deep voice to Frodo later on in Lothlorien. The idea that these powerful beings could take the One Ring and do horrible things with it is a frightening prospect indeed. Bilbo nearly leaves with the ring, but then he drops it to the ground. Just Jackson's framing and Shore's music make the simple act of dropping a small object in one's home as having the weight of the world. To accomplish this hard thud with no roll, they actually built an enlarged prop ring with a magnetized surface so that it would fall flat, and it makes the ring look like a heavy burden that has now been lifted from Bilbo. Almost immediately, Bilbo reverts to his cheery self. I've thought up an ending for my book. And he lived happily ever after, to the end of his days. Just touching the ring and sensing Sauron's gaze has left Gandalf in a delirious state by the hearth until Frodo arrives and stirs him. He's gone, hasn't he? Gandalf seals it in an envelope, tells Frodo to keep it secret, keep it safe, and heads out in a rush. And we cut to the towers and the parapets of Barad-dûr, and we hear the voice of Gollum screaming, <laughs> And the Nazgul ride! Gandalf sees the fires of Mount Doom erupting as he rides to Minas Tirith in Gondor, a setting that will play a much bigger role in Return of the King. The Gondorian archivist is a cameo by Michael Ellsworth, who played the elf lord Círdan in the prologue. Here, Gandalf reads the second of this film's accounts of the events of 3434, this time a writing by Isildur himself, who explains that the ring's markings were once clear to him but faded, revealed now only by fire. Again, this is a story about stories. Like Rashomon, we don't get the full story of what happened until we hear it three different ways. This is why history gets lost and the lessons of the past fade. People stop talking and it requires years of research to piece it all back together. Or, well, I guess in this case, weeks. Because in the text, Gandalf's research trip takes 17 years as Frodo ages from 33 to 50. While 33 is considered the year a hobbit comes of age, at age 50, book Frodo is older. He's more decisive and generally wearier than the more youthful and uncertain film Frodo is played by Elijah Wood. So this film condenses this time that Gandalf is gone to just a few weeks. But it makes for more heart pounding and intense first act that really helps this movie get going because now Gandalf is in a race against the Nazgul on their way to the Shire. They inquire from a farmer. Shire There's no around here. This is Farmer Maggot, a character with much more depth in the book. We later hear him yelling at Merry and Pippin on the farm. Back in Hobbiton, at the Green Dragon, they're singing a drinking song. Better than rain or rippling brook. As I'm on go beer inside this tub. <laughs> Inside this Took. His name is Peregrine Took. So this song is based on Ho 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 to the Bottle I Go from the A Shortcut to the Mushrooms chapter in Fellowship of the Ring, but they slightly alter the lyrics to incorporate a part of the Bath song, which Pippin sings at another point. Look, Tolkien just put a lot of goddamn songs in there and you gotta love them. Now remember when Gandalf left, he warned Frodo. Keep it secret. Keep it safe. And now, frazzled, he begs. Is it secret? Is it safe? Gandalf throws the ring into the fire and Frodo sees the markings that reflect in red on his face. Like the horrible news that reflected on Ripley's face in the heart of Mother on the Nostromo. These runes are the black speech of Mordor, or Mothar. And here on the prop, they are written in the script of Tanguar, one of many written languages created by Tolkien. The gruff whispers we hear is the voice of Sauron chanting, Hush, Nask, Turpatruk, which Gandalf translates into the common tongue here. One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, fight them. The ring is one of the most brilliant creations in all of fiction. As a symbol of wealth, it represents avarice, the worst in humanity, the fact that it is in the shape of a ring, something that is very difficult to destroy, that has no beginning, that has no end, something that symbolizes marriage, a pact, a bond, corrupted in a way that represents the bond between Sauron, the representation of evil, to whoever possesses this ring. They do such a good job in this movie, making the ring terrifying. It is the equivalent in this war story of a weapon of mass destruction. And no matter how many times I read Lord of the Rings or watch this movie, I think it's so brilliant to have a story where a simple object has to be destroyed. Not acquired, not returned to its rightful owner, but just destroyed from the earth. Since the ring cannot stay in the Shire and Gandalf cannot wield it himself, obviously, Frodo has to leave and carry it himself. And they plan to meet in the village of Bree, but Sam has been dropping eaves outside. That is, I heard a good deal about a ring and a dark lord and something about the end of the world, but 
Please, Mr. Gandalf, sir, don't hurt me. Now, the book chapter ends with Sam bursting into tears when he realizes Gandalf just wants him to accompany Frodo and meet the elves. But I really love this passage of the book because it gives us insight to how much Sam loves stories and myth. He says, I listened because I couldn't help myself, if you know what I mean. Lord, bless me, sir, but I do love tales of that sort, and I believe them too. It sets up Sam's beautiful speech at the end of Two Towers that I will get emotional when I get to, I promise you. Sam stops on a farm to say that if he takes one more step, he'll be further away from home than he's ever been. Come on, Sam. Howard Shore brings back a leitmotif to the Shire theme, but just with the French horn, like the one last instrument you would hear as the other sections fade out as you leave your home behind. In this wide shot and early DVD releases, you can actually see sunlight reflecting off a car in the background, but this was removed in later versions. While making camp, Frodo and Sam hear some singing. Wood Elves. Now, the song they're singing is A Elbereth Gilthoniel, which is an elvish hymn to Varda. Varda is one of the godlike Valar, and this song reflects Tolkien's devout Roman Catholicism because this is essentially Mary, Queen of Heaven. Frodo explains that the elves are leaving Middle-earth, headed to the Grey Havens to depart west for Valinor. Sam says, I don't know why. It makes me sad. Neither of them know it here, but maybe it's because Frodo is destined to leave Sam behind one day on such a voyage. But initially when we hear singing, book readers think it might be Tom Bombadil. One of the major omissions from Tolkien's text by Peter Jackson, Tom is a peculiar woodland fellow who sings constantly. He saves the hobbits from a sentient willow tree and grants them their swords and seems immune to the powers of the ring. Jackson considered working the cameo of a man in a feathered hat darting through the trees that they would have spotted. But ultimately, Tom Bombadil was deemed a lower priority because he doesn't really contribute to the corrupting influence of the One Ring, which in Peter Jackson's mind was really the focus of these films. Meanwhile, Gandalf rides for Isengard, where he meets the wizard Saruman, played by the great Christopher Lee, a longtime reader of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings books, and the only person involved with this film trilogy to have actually met J.R.R. Tolkien. Throughout his many decades as an actor, he had dreamed of playing Gandalf one day, but now he just considered himself too old for the part, with all of its horse riding and fighting that would be required, and instead just decides to crush it in these movies as Saruman. So Gandalf reports to him that the One Ring was found. Under my very nose, your love of the halfling's leaf has clearly slowed your mind. Yeah, basically too high to function. Yeah, and if you look at Gandalf's staff here, you can see it has a notch in the top so that he can shove his pipe in there. So Saruman's like, dude, you brought your bong to work. No shit, you missed the ring. But since Saruman has already been turned by Sauron, it is possible that Gandalf has been under the influence by the voice of Saruman, which is explored in a chapter of the same name in the Two Towers. It's kind of a magical ability emitted by Saruman that has a corrupting influence. But we can also forgive Gandalf for this because several lesser rings were actually forged at the same time as a 19, and the One Ring was known for just having a simple, unassuming look to it. Its true nature would only be revealed by fire or by use and application. Also, this drug shaming coming from Saruman, total bullshit, because in the books, it is said that he loves the long bottom leaf so much that he imported it from the Shire, and in the Two Towers film extended edition, Merry and Pippin find this weed in Saruman's storehouse. So Saruman describes the Eye of Sauron. A great eye, lidless wreathed in flame. He got this visual description from the Palantir, the Seen Stone. In total, there were seven of these that were brought to Middle-earth. They were gifts from the elves to the faithful Numenorians, but four of them were lost, which Gandalf fears would make any of these vulnerable. He briefly sees the Eye of Sauron flashing on him. The Eye of Sauron is depicted in these films as a giant flaming eye atop the Tower of Baradur. This is some pretty sick artistic license from Peter Jackson. He said that he interpreted Tolkien's description of Sauron's watchful presence as a literal physical physical manifestation of an eye. And honestly, I think these movies are better for it. <laughs> love the Eye of Sauron. Now, while in the text, Saruman just presents Gandalf with an ultimatum and Gandalf refuses, so Saruman locks him up atop the pinnacle. Here, we need action. So we get this wild force push wizard duel. Peter Jackson has said that he doesn't really like showing wizard magic on film. So instead of like a Dumbledore versus Voldemort battle, so we get this pretty cool fight that feels really personal and brutal between the two old wizards. Like it's mostly shot in close up with grunts and gasps and blood on their faces. I mean, I kind of love it. Back on the outskirts of the 
Shire, Frodo and Sam run into Merry and Pippin, stealing some of Farmer Maggot's crop. Dominic Monaghan, Billy Boyd, Sean Astin, and Elijah Wood were really able to bond quite a bit on set as actors who had to wake up well before everyone else did to have their prosthetic feet applied, a process that took hours and hours. And apparently the actors did spend a few weeks just hanging out on the set in New Zealand so that their camaraderie would feel natural. So when they bump into each other here, it just works. A new life comes into the film. And from here forward, we just would hate to see any of these four parts. So they run for it. Notice how Sam bumps into them to send them rolling down the hill. Later on in this movie at the bridge of Casa Doom in Moria, Sam almost bumps into them to knock them into the chasm, but he catches himself at the last second. At the bottom of this hill, Mary says, That was just a detour, a shortcut. Shortcut to what? Mushrooms! Which is a nod of this chapter in the book, which is called A Shortcut to Mushrooms. But Frodo gets a vibe and he shoes them off the road and they hide from a Nazgul beneath the roots. A shot that Peter Jackson actually based on the artwork of John Howe, but Howe actually based his artwork on a shot from the 1978 Ralph Bakshi film. And I remember seeing that animated shot as a kid before the Peter Jackson trilogy came out. And yeah, the red eyes of the Nazgul and the rotoscoped human-like movement just stays with you. It's so rare that they make animation that way anymore, but they did in this movie and in this case, it is creepy. And you know it creeped out Peter Jackson too, because we don't see the Nazgul's eyes, but we do briefly see the horse's eye, and that horse's eye is red. Also, this horse's Winnie totally sounds like he's saying, hi. 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 So Mary leads the way to Buckleberry Ferry. Apparently Dominic Monaghan got a splinter through his prosthetic foot on the dock that he was running down. He thought it was gonna be a massive splinter, but when they removed it, it was super small. So from here forward, Billy Boyd would always mock him anytime he had like a slight injury. Do you ever check the weather before you head out for the day and then you see that it's gonna be rainy and then sunny and then rainy again and then you just have no idea what to wear? Hey, I would love to be a hobbit and not have to think about this thing, but I'm a descendant of Numenor and this is part of what's wrong with me. And it used to be that I could just grab a pair of Vessies, slip them on my feet, but now, Vessi can keep you dry and comfortable from head to toe. For your feet, there is a Vessi Soho sneaker. 100% waterproof, comfy, and stylish. But if it's gonna be snowy and cold, the Alta is Vessi's take on a waterproof boot with added traction for dealing with ice and temperature rated to keep your feet warm even when it is freezing. No Saruman blizzard's gonna keep you down when you're wearing these. And when it's pouring and you need more than your feet to be dry, Vessi's Overcast is a waterproof jacket with soft fleece lining for warmth and a wind resistant stretchy shell so you can have complete freedom of movement back in the and if you want to finish things off, you can also grab a pair of Vessi gloves to keep your hands as warm and as dry as the rest of you. With Vessi, rainy days can be a thing that gets you out of the house rather than trapping you inside. No matter the weather, no matter the time of year, Vessi's got you covered. To get some Vessi gear for yourself, check out the Vessi styles at Vessi.com slash deep dive. And thanks again to Vessi for sponsoring this episode. So they make it to the town of Bree, where they pass this villager who's eating a carrot. This is Albert Dreary, a cameo by Peter Jackson. He also cameos in this town in The Hobbit, even though it would would be long before. Maybe it's like a relative. In the Prancing Pony Inn, they constructed two different sizes of the sets and the props to pull off the size difference effect for the hobbits. And they also had many of the human patrons walking around on stilts to emphasize the height difference. Frodo begins to just fondle the ring and Sauron's whisper of the word Baggins alerts all the men in the pub. Frodo trips and the ring goes flying and lands perfectly on Frodo's finger, one of many iconic shots from the series. You can see the ring maneuvering to find its way to Frodo's finger as Gandalf warned him when they parted, the ring wants to be found. So by wearing the ring, Frodo goes invisible from their perspective, but actually enters another plane that is considered to be part of the unseen. And particularly this part of the Wraith world where the cursed spirits dwell. Some beings in Tolkien's text can exist both in the seen and the unseen worlds, like the Ainur and the elves who dwelt in Valinor. But in this case, the ring wraiths, they can live both in the seen and the unseen world. And here, Frodo sees Sauron for the first time. There is no life. The creepiest thing about this is just how smoothly Frodo transitions back into the scene world of the pub, but you can still feel the taste of Sauron croaking the word death staying with him. And we meet Sexy Sexy Strider, AKA Aragorn, Viggo Mortensen. But to disappear entirely. That is a rare gift. It's a fitting opening line for the character of Aragorn in the movie, as he is Isildur's heir, and he begins his film in denial of his calling, but this is a major departure from the text, in which Aragorn has no doubts that he should be king and actively works toward it. He's carrying the shards of Narsil with him from the start, and he reforges them into Anduril before the Fellowship leaves Rivendell. The Nazgul charge into the town of Bree. 
this amazing music from Howard Shore is called A Knife in the Dark. It's named after chapter 11 of Fellowship of the Ring. The lyrics are actually sung in the language of Anduaic, which is a fictional language from Tolkien, and it was spoken by the men of Numenor during the Second Age. This is the language these kings would have spoken. The choir lyrics translate to, we deny our maker, we cling to the darkness, we grasp for ourselves power and glory. Now we come the nine lords of eternal life. The earth groans and the wind, the wind is crying. And I love the shot of the innkeeper just sobbing as they glide past. Like they're not even walking, they're just floating into the prancing pony. And Peter Jackson cleverly sets us up to think the hobbits are in these tiny beds in this inn, but they are of course across the street all sharing one big man bed. It's a classic cinematic Silence of the Lambs. What door are they at? Gimmick that always works on me. Aragorn leads them toward Rivendell and he can always hear their whispers and chatter well behind them. So when Pippin asks Mary about second breakfast, eleven seas, luncheon, afternoon tea, dinner, supper, Aragorn overhears this fretting and tosses back two apples. I like how Pippin looks up. Like, where do you think the first one came from? While resting in the Midgewater marshes, Aragorn sings the song in Elvish. <laughs> yes, this is a song of Baron and Luthien, which in the text, Aragorn actually sings a weather top to ease the nerves of the hobbits. Here, he explains to Frodo, Tis the lay of Luthien, the elf maiden who gave her love to Baron, a mortal. What happened to her? She died. So Arwen is descended from the line of Luthien and Beren, as is Aragorn technically, because their grandfather was Elwing, who led to Arendil. But yes, this beautiful romance is the inspiration for the film version of Arwen and her relationship with Aragorn. They camp at Weathertop, which was an important tower thousands of years prior, when Elendil, father to Isildur, stored the Palantir scene stones there. And later on, the Witch King of Angmar raised the tower and left it in ruins. In the text, Gandalf actually fought the Nazgul and the Witch King here three days prior. So now the Nazgul know these ruins pretty well, and they surround the hobbits. Frodo, knowing the ring helped him vanish in the Prancing Pony, slips it on here, but it just crosses them into the unseen Wraith world with them. For Frodo, it's kind of like dying and joining the ghosts. Jackson's effects crew inverses to negative, whereas before they were cast in shadow, now they glow white. And Frodo hears Sauron's whisper, and he pulls the ring away, but the Witch King stabs him in the shoulder with the Morgul knife. Frodo will wince from the pain of the stab for the rest of his life, and it's perhaps the most cited literary example of the unhealable wound archetype. This often symbolizes a loss of innocence, and for Frodo, it's a sharp punishment for pulling the ring in closer to himself, taking one step closer to Gollum. Gandalf catches a moth. Among the words he whispers is the name Gwahir, which is the name of the great eagle who later rescues him. And I hate answering this question, but you know, why didn't they use the eagles to take the ring to Mordor? Four reasons, folks. One, the whole point of hobbits having to take the ring into Mordor is to sneak undetected. Like if they took eagles, Sauron would have spotted them, engaged them in aerial combat with the Nazgul and recovered the ring. Two, the eagles as powerful, intelligent beings would have been just as at risk of being corrupted by the ring as men, elves, wizards, or dwarves were. It needed to be humble hobbits on foot. Three, the eagles didn't want to intervene at first. They lost a ton of their numbers when they intervened in the past wars, and they required some convincing. Though Tolkien denies it, many academics have compared Lord of the Rings to the two world wars of Tolkien's lifetime, and likened the eagles to the late but decisive intervention by the Americans in World War II. And four, perhaps the best answer is from Tolkien himself. People run into me at the pub and ask why, why didn't they just fly the, the eagles to Mordor? Uh, it would have made the quest a whole lot easier. And I, I told him uh, the, the same thing that, I, that I'm telling you right now. Uh, you know, uh, shut up. Meanwhile, Saruman breeds in the mud of the Isengard mines, uruk -hai, a special breed of orc. Now, typical orcs are suggested to reproduce through normal sexual means, considered by a text in the Silmarillion to be bred by Melkor, aka Morgoth, in the first stage as kind of a mockery and envy of elves. But this beastly uruk -hai, who immediately kills its midwife, is named Lurtz, and it's played by Lawrence Makoare, which is an original character by Peter Jackson. It's not in Tolkien's text. While Frodo reels from the wound, they stop by the petrified trolls in Bilbo's story. Look, Frodo. 
It's Mr. Bilbo's trolls. These trolls, whom we meet in the 2012 Hobbit film, are named Tom, Bert, and William. While looking for the King's Foil weed, Arwen holds a sword to Aragorn. This sword is Hathafang, the same sword wielded by Elrond 3,000 years prior against Sauron in the Last Alliance. The inscription that's caught in the light here is Tengwar Ruins in the Elvish language of Sindarin, which translates to, this blade is called Hathafang, a noble defense against the enemy throng for a noble lady. So in Sindarin, Arwen means noble woman. And in the text, the only elf to have his sword is described was Igomoth of Gondolin, whose sword was described as being curved, and the film crew just kind of used that little detail to build an entire story to the sword. It passed down from Arwen's great-grandmother, who had also fallen in love with a mortal, and it was eventually passed down to Elrond, and then to Arwen. So Arwen is a much smaller character in the text, who merely appears at the Council of Elrond, and only really speaks one line in Return of the King after the ring is destroyed. But since she is the character that Aragorn ends up marrying, Peter and Fran and Philippa rightfully fleshed out her character in these films, though at this point in the story in the text, it is the elf Glorfindel who delivers Frodo to Rivendell. But during this chase with Arwen and Frodo, you can see how the horses of the Nazgul have the symbol of the Eye of Sauron on their harnesses. Very, very cool detail. So Arwen and Frodo cross the river Bruinen, and Arwen chants. <laughs> Which translates to Waters of the Hithagalir. Here, the word of power, rush waters of Brienon against the ring wraiths. So, the Hithagalir are the peaks of the Misty Mountains, where the snowpacks are that feed this river. And this is actually a kind of magic that is really conjured by Elrond upstream. So, Frodo wakes up in the house of Elrond in Rivendell, where Gandalf reflects on his escape from Saruman, but doesn't yet verbalize these details to Frodo. There is only one Lord of the Ring, and he does not share. Power. We see Gandalf escaping on the back of the Gwai here, and the moon is framed perfectly in the Tower of Orthanc, precisely in the form of Peter Jackson's depiction of the Barad-dûr in the Eye of Sauron, kind of giving us our two towers here. For Rivendell's design, Tolkien was actually inspired by the town of Lauterbrunnen in the Swiss Alps, and the matte painting used for this film definitely took notes from that real-life location as well. As Frodo looks out on the waterfalls, autumnal leaves drop as they do throughout this part of the movie. As Gandalf noted, it is autumn, the 24th of October. Throughout these Rivendell scenes, a half dozen crew members were always positioned above the set, dropping these leaves in the background. The season of autumn, whether it's in films or TV or books, often symbolizes old age, the approaching of death. And for the elves, this seasonal shift isn't just symbolic, it literally means their time is coming to an end. They are in the process of leaving Middle Earth to return west to Valinor. Frodo reunites with Bilbo and flips through his finally finished book, where we see dwarven ruins on one page that translate to stand by the gray stone when the thrush knocks and the setting sun with the last light of Durin's day will shine upon the keyhole. This is a reference to the secret entrance to the Lonely Mountain. On another page, we see two swords and a key on the opposite page. The swords are Glamdring and Orchrist. The two swords, Bilbo and the dwarves found in the troll cave. And that key that's referenced is used to enter the stone troll's horde from the Hobbit. And then on another page, on the left margin, are the names of the 13 dwarves from the Hobbit to the left of a drawing of Thorin's harp. And these include poor, poor Ori, whose corpse we see later in this movie. But this whole section is a really important story beat for Frodo. I spent all my childhood pretending I was off somewhere else, but my own adventure turned out to be quite different. He tells his uncle that he's not like him, and that wariness makes Frodo the natural candidate for the ring quest. He bears the ring not out of a thirst for adventure, but to ensure that he will have a home to return to. Gandalf and Elrond debate what to do with the ring, and Elrond is reluctant to trust men, remembering Isildur's failure in Mount Doom. Destroy it! Yes, Isildur's evil little smile is actually just rendered that way in the memory of Elrond. His anti-men bias is coloring it as an act of weakness and evil, and not really allowing any empathy for Isildur. We meet Boromir, son of Denethor, Denethor being the steward of Gondor. Boromir played wonderfully by Sean Bean, and he meets Aragorn. Aragorn is reading a book, and that cover reads, I believe, translating to the wisdom of the Eldar, and this is likely the account in the story of the Last Alliance as told by Elrond. So essentially, Aragorn would be reading this moment all the elves talking shit about his ancestor Isildur and telling everyone that all men are gutless cowards. So what's the point? Now nearby, a statue holds the shattered pieces of the Narsil sword. Vermeer here is looking at this mural of Isildur swinging Narsil at Sauron. Alan Lee himself actually painted this, and in this shot, he did not include the one ring on Sauron's finger. But when we revisit this location in the first Hobbit film in 2012, the ring was actually painted in. Vermeer greets Aragorn apprehensively at first. We are here on common purpose. Friend. Yes, I love the implicit question mark that Sean Bean adds to friend, because fellowship is not a blessing that comes easily to him. Boromir fawns over the shards of Narsil, and the broken blade cuts his finger. Still sharp. No 
more than a broken head. These broken blades represent the fragmented factions of men. Their brokenness actually hurts Boromir the most. Aragorn grabs Narsil, that hilt naturally fitting in its grip, and Arwen says, You are a Sildor's heir, not a Sildor himself. As she says this, Aragorn's head blocks out the image of a Sildor on the mural behind him. Arwen chooses a mortal life with Aragorn. I would rather share one lifetime with you than face all the ages of this world alone. This even star pendant was an adaptation of the elf stone in the text, that being an elven craft that passed from Galadriel to her daughter, Celebrian, and then to Arwen. In the text, Galadriel gives the elf stone to Aragorn on Arwen's behalf to remind him that he is Elisar, king of Gondor. And it's meant to be a sign that the Valar had not forsaken Middle-earth. So I think we can see even this pendant as a sign of fellowship forged by and granted by the deities of this world. Onto the Council of Elrond, where these exact stakes are just put in much simpler terms. You will unite or you will fall. Each race is bound to this fate, this one doom. And I really love the scenic geography here because notice behind Elrond is that statue of Celebrion, the one that holds the shards of Narsil from the previous scene. So the history of the last alliance breaking underscores this whole deliberation. Seated to the left of Aragorn is actually Britt McKenzie of Flight of the Concords, a cameo that was so popular that they named this character Figwit, and he returns in Return of the King and also plays a different elf in The Hobbit. So Frodo places the One Ring on the pedestal, looking relieved to have this burden momentarily lifted. Boromir shares his nightmare that he had about a voice saying, your doom is near at hand, his sealder's bane is found, and he reaches for the ring, but Gandalf rises and shouts in black speech. Now, Gandalf didn't dare utter the black speech in the Shire, but he says the words here in Rivendell. And of course, they translate to one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, bind them. Boromir sees the ring as a gift. Give Gondor the weapon of the enemy. Let us use it against him. Yes, the music in the background on the solo French horn is actually a piece that Howard Shore would later evolve into the Gondor theme in Return of the King. He didn't know it yet when he composed this bit for Boromir, though. Gimli tries to smash it. What are we waiting for? <laughs> Peter Jackson inserts a few frames of the Eye of Sauron, including one frame in negative monochrome colors to make it really feel like it's flashing at us. Elrond says the ring must be cast back into the fiery chasm of Mount Doom from which it came, and cue Boromir's meme. One does not simply walk into Mordor. So in the 2020 cast reunion, Peter Jackson actually revealed why Sean Bean was looking down with his hand over his eyes in this moment. That entire speech that Sean had to deliver at the Council of Elrond was written the night before. It's yeah. long and we gave it to Sean that in the morning he arrived. What Sean did, which I thought was very clever, is he, is he, got, is he got a printout of the speech taped, taped to his knee. It, it, it was on his knee. And when he did that scene, you'll see one cannot just walk into Mordor. <laughs> if you watch the scene now, you'll 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 see every time that Sean has to has to check check his script. <laughs> 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 so at this point, the council just erupts, and Gimli takes particular anger at Legolas. I will be dead before I see the ring in the hands of an elf! I love the spit that Jonathan Rhys Davies whips up on the word elf. The actor had a skin reaction to that prosthetic nose that made it extremely irritating throughout the film, and it just seems like he channels that into every line read. So the Council of Elrond scene was one of the longest shoots for this film, as Peter Fran and Philippa kept having to rewrite it to reduce the exposition of the text and to maintain the visual order of each of these feuding parties. While in the book, Frodo at this point has already decided to take the ring to Mount Doom, but this scene restages that decision to happen right here. I will take it. I will take the ring to Mordor. And it happens because Frodo sees all the arguing leaders reflected in the gold of the ring. This disagreement is exactly what Sauron wants, and it will consume them all in fire. So the fellowship forms. I will help you bear this burden, Frodo Baggins, as long as it is yours to bear. If by my life or death I can protect you, I will. You have my sword. And then Legolas says literally the one line he will say to Frodo in this entire trilogy. And you have my bow. And my axe. Now, after this, the other three hobbits will run in to swear their loyalty too, but notice Boromir only steps forward to say this. You carry the fate of us all, little one. If this is indeed the will of the council, then Gondor will see it done. 
Yeah, Boromir doesn't literally pledge his life in the way the others do, which you could see as a bit of foreshadowing of his betrayal, but I don't think we should make the mistake of judging Boromir the way Elrond judges Isildur. I think Boromir's skepticism is what makes him the most relatable character. He, right now, is expressing the weakness that any of us would have. That's why he says the fates of us all. What honestly would this guy have in common with any of these others? He already sees his fate as diverging from the rest. Bilbo gives Frodo his sword, named Sting, as well as his mithril armor. Bilbo spots his old ring, and the darkness comes out. <laughs> To achieve this effect, they actually created a rubber puppet with a horrific face and then superimposed that over Ian Holmes' face. This puppet is essentially what Bilbo would look like if he went full Gollum. So it's just one final scare for Frodo of what his possible fate could be before he sets off. Sure, his fellowship theme trumpets as they venture away from Rivendell. Like the goddamn 96 bulls, Boromir trains Merry and Pippin. Good, very good. Yeah, these numbers actually refer to fencing lines of attack. So two is low left, four is mid right, five is head. And then Merry and Pippin tackle Boromir to the ground. Later, they actually take down one of the uruk in a similar way. When the cats were shooting these scenes in the mountain terrain, Sean Bean reportedly hated taking the helicopter up to the set, so he insisted on hiking for hours to get there on his feet. Then they spot the Crabine from Dunland, aka Spy Crows, sent by Saruman. So Dunland is a kingdom adjacent to Rohan. In generations prior, the ruler of Dunland tried to marry his son to the princess of Rohan that was denied, and then war broke out, which is why Saruman was so easily able to to convince these birds to spy for him. And since the path south is being watched, they turn to the pass of Caradhras. Frodo takes a tumble in the snow and loses the ring, and we see it framed in this close-up, and it's one of my favorite shots, because for this, they had to use that enlarged ring again. They had to do it because if they tried to shoot a normal-sized ring, just an extreme close-up, the lens wouldn't be able to capture the actors in the background. So those chunks of snow crystals in the middle of the ring are actually just snow piled up in a specific way to look like a thimble's worth of snow, but it's actually like a bucket's worth of snow clumped every ever so slightly to look like it's a lesser amount. And then to lift the ring, they actually had to do it quickly to make it look like it was a small chain, when really it was a larger clunky chain that they had to lift like from a stepladder. Now remember, before that ring, when it was dislodged, was eager to wiggle onto Frodo's finger, but now that they're all headed toward Mount Doom, marched there by this formidable fellowship, this ring is under threat. So it takes every opportunity to actually break loose from Frodo and to try to find a new host, in this case, the most temptable of the group, Boromir. And it almost leads to violence. Aragorn had his his hand on his sword hilt. So the crows snitch that they're in the mountains, so Saruman hits them with a blizzard. Legolas, as the lightest of the bunch, walks on top of the snow while the others sink through it. In Tolkien's text, Legolas is a real prick about this, saying, let a plowman plow, but choose an otter for swimming, and for running light over grass and leaf, or over snow, an elf. And then Frodo notices he's not even wearing boots, he's just wearing like light slippers. Now remember earlier, Gandalf told Gimli that he would only go into Moria if he had no other choice, and now he hears Saruman's taunt. You know what they awoke in the darkness of Khazadu, shadow and flame. Yes, we'll meet the Balrog soon, but really Gandalf is just kind of sensing his own possible death in certain transformation. It's not his own death he fears, it's the prospect of breaking the fellowship and not being able to help Frodo get to where he needs to go. So that's why Gandalf makes Frodo decide here. Gandalf can't decide himself to lead them to death. So they make it to the western walls of Moria. Moonlight illuminates the doors of Durin. These were forged by the elf Celebrimbor. The doors are almost an exact match to Tolkien's original sketch, which we just saw in Saruman's book. Gandalf attempts to open the door by speaking Dwarvish. <laughs> Which translates to, Gate of the Elves open now for me, and then... <laughs> which translates to doorway of the door folk, listen to the word of my tongue. Frodo eventually figures it out. It's a riddle. Speak friend and enter. What's the elvish word for friend? Melod. Now in Tolkien's text, Gandalf is the one who figured this out without Frodo's help. But this door being a token of past friendship between elves and dwarves is yet another example of fellowship being the antidote to the ring's evil. They realize the dwarves inside were killed and it's a tomb, but their path behind them is blocked by the Kraken-esque watcher in the water. So inside of Moria, Frodo spots Gollum, and Gandalf tells them that his name used to be Smeagol. And Frodo says, It's a pity Bilbo didn't kill him when he had the chance. It was pity that stayed Bilbo's hand. Ah, the pity of Bilbo is one of the most important passages from Tolkien. And in the text, it actually comes up way earlier when Gandalf is explaining the ring's history to Frodo all the way back in Bag's End. But here, Gandalf goes on to say the line, Do not be too eager to deal out death and judgment. Even the very wise can see all ends. My heart tells me that Gollum has some part to play yet. 
for good or ill before this is over. One could say that because Bilbo began his ownership of the ring with an act of pity, that is what kept the ring from turning his heart evil. But Smeagol, by comparison, killed Dagal to get the ring, which is an act of evil, so that's why it corrupted him completely. Of course, Gandalf's words will prove to be prophetic. Not only does Gollum play a huge role as we get onto Two Towers and Return of the King, his final act in this story is to attack Frodo when that ring corrupts him in that last second on the cliff in Mount Doom. To sever Frodo's finger like a sealed severed the fingers of Sauron to free the ring and to send that ring hurtling down into the lava. Therefore, the pity of Bilbo to keep Gollum alive means everything to the story. Or as Gandalf says here, The pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many. Really, in these final hours before the Balrog, Gandalf just drops great quote after great quote. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. If he died in the end of Always follow your nose. Yeah, that's just kind of what happens to mentors when their time is limited. So Gimli sobs as they find the tomb of Balin. This chamber would be the final resting place of most of the dwarves that accompany Bilbo in The Hobbit. The holder of the book, Ori, even wears the same scarf here that he wears in the 2012 Hobbit film. Actually, in the wide shot of this room, you can see the axe that Gimli will later pick up and use for the rest of these films. Gandalf pulls the book from Ori's hands. This is a book of Mazar Bul, which Ori initially wrote in neat dwarvish runes until he got to the end that he writes in hasty elvish script to save time and these final words are clearly written in a terrifying panic script you cannot get out they are coming so orcs swarm in followed by a giant cave troll i love this little detail of when legolas fires an arrow at his chest and there's a little vfx detail when aragorn pulls on its chain to repel it from sam and that chain catches onto legolas's arrow and breaks it off it's so hard to notice but it's such a cool detail while the dwarves greed for mithril was part of their undoing here in moria bilbo's mithril armor given to frodo is what saves him here in moria from the cave troll stab so they make for the bridge of khazad doom and the balrogs roar clear the orcs. A Balrog, a demon of the ancient world, his foe is beyond any of you. So, Balrogs are classified as Maiar in the hierarchy of all powerful beings in the Lord of the Rings mythology, but Istari, aka wizards, are also considered Maiar. But Balrogs were created by Melkor, aka Morgoth, Sauron's former master in the first age. He created them by manipulating them out of fire. And Gandalf kind of hints at this lineage when he confronts this Balrog, known as Durin's Bane, here on the bridge of Khazad Doom. I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Arnor. Dark fire will not avail you! Flame of Udon! Yes, he's referring to their shared origin from the fires of the sun. So the ultimate creator god figure of Middle-earth is known as Iru Iluvatar. This is one who held the secret fire, which was the ability to create and imbue life. It was Iru who created the Ainur, who split and became the Valar deities, and then the lesser Maiar. So the Balrog is referred to as the Flame of Undun. Undun was a fortress of Morgoth and the home of the Balrogs. So the secret fire creates, the Flame of Undun corrupts and destroys. Again, Gandalf is basically saying, hey, we're both Maiar, we're both empowered by God's fire, but my fire is more powerful than yours because my fire is purer, whereas yours is like bastardized and diluted and like cooked up in like a meth lab. And it's with that godly light that Gandalf screams this great line. You shall not pass! And I also see this as Gandalf telling the Balrog that he shall not pass through the unseen the way Gandalf soon will. So whatever happens, there's going to be no cosmic transformation awaiting Durin's bane, only destruction. Though the Balrog falls, his whip snatches Gandalf's foot. Fly, you fools! Ah, the death of the mentor is another classic archetypal story beat. And even though Gandalf's death here is truly a transformation to Gandalf the White, as we'll see in the Two Towers, it is the death of Gandalf the Grey, the death of the wizard who is blinded by uncertainty, by love, and by dank, dank weed. And this death teaches the remaining eight members of the Fellowship a critical lesson, how to mourn, how to keep fighting, and how to feel fellowship for absent friends. Because the destiny of this fellowship is not to stay together through the end of the journey, but for it to be a long distance relationship among fractured parties. And I just wanna pause on this moment of the film because it is so, so rare in Hollywood epics to just stop and show your heroes breaking down, sobbing. I'm not talking like Hawkeye angrily shouting at Thor and like a tiny little tear on Cap's cheek as Hulk throws a bench, but these characters are collapsing on the ground, holding each other, 
inconsolably whimpering. So much so that Aragorn has to bark at Legolas to get everyone back on their feet. They're mourning their friend is what fellowship looks like. This is why evil doesn't stand a chance. On to Lothlorien, where they meet Haldir, who speaks freely with Legolas and Elvish, which really pisses off Gimli. Speak words we can all understand. We have not had dealings with the dwarves since the dark days. Ishkakwi, I Dorog Nol. Yes, the dwarvish he speaks translates to I spit on your grave, which is why Aragorn says, well, th that wasn't very courteous. Now, you'll notice the elves of this area have light blue eyes, whereas the elves of Rivendell, like Elrond and Arwen, all have a darker shade of blue. Haldir leads them to the Karas Galadhon, which is the home of Galadriel and her husband Celeborn. The thick trees block out natural sunlight, apart for a few beams and some strategically placed lanterns, as Galadriel, still possessing one of the three elven rings of power, Nenya, is what keeps Sauron from being able to see into this realm. Galadriel appears to them glowing, and Peter Jackson actually used a special lighting rig for Kate Blanchett so that in every close-up, her eyes appear to reflect starlight. This is because she is among the last elves of Middle-earth to have seen the light of the two trees of Valinor before they were destroyed in the First Age. Legolas says that they went needlessly into the net of Moria, and Gimli tilts his head in shame, but Galadriel comforts him. Needless were none of the deeds of Gandalf in life. We do not yet know his full purpose. Galadriel refuses to let the Fellowship die just because one member is absent. She knows that the Istari would not die in vain. Peter Jackson shoots much of this scene in tight close-ups of the characters' eyes, giving the effect of Galadriel's voice echoing in their minds and piercing their souls, specifically with Boromir on the word grief. And perhaps the creepiest effect in this film, other than Bilbo's jump scare, Galadriel literally does this telepathic effect from Frodo's perspective. Tonight, you will sleep Welcome, Frodo of the Shire. One who has seen me die. Ooh, the way that whisper just kind of creeps up out of nowhere. While they rest, Legolas hears the elves singing a lament for Gandalf. What do they say about him? I have not the heart to tell you. For me, the grief is still too near. Yeah, he doesn't want to tell him, but I will. This Sindarin translates to, your journey has ended in darkness. And then another line translates to, my friend, my friend, O Pilgrim Grey. And then another one translates to, the bonds cut the spirit broken. So the reason Legolas doesn't tell them is that he just might not want to break their spirits. So Sam here improvising a verse honoring Gandalf's awesome fireworks really does a trick. Meanwhile, a shaken Boromir tells Aragorn that Galadriel's voice on the word grief spoke to the fall of his father in Gondor and how he dreams of restoring Gondor's glory. Glory. Have you ever seen his Aragorn? The white tower of Exalion, glimmering like a spike of pearl and silver. Have you ever been called home by the clear ringing of silver trumpets? Aragorn says that he saw the city long ago, but Boromir says, One day, our paths will lead us there. Ah, so we've gone from Gondor needs no king and the fates of us all to our path and the lords of Gondor have returned. So now Frodo peers into the mirror of Galadriel. So what is it about Galadriel's connection with water? Well, originally in Fellowship of the Ring, Galadriel's ring is just kind of referred to as the Ring of Adamant, which she calls it here. But later in the Silmarillion, Tolkien identified it as Ninya, which is the Ring of Water. Galadriel's mother was one of the Teleri, which were the elves who love water and sea the most. And according to the creation mythology of this world, this world being known as Arda, water is said to hold an echo of the very first music that crafted this world, the Song of the Ainur. And in Tolkien's text, Galadriel breathes on the water before Frodo looks into it, which actually comes from a ritual in Catholic baptism, Tolkien being a devout Catholic. And in a Catholic baptism, the priest always breathes on the holy water. So Galadriel cryptically says that the mirror shows many things, things that were, things that are, and some things that have not yet come to pass. And Frodo, in this water, sees his friends, Sam, Mary, Pippin, and and Legolas, okay. I mean, it's a guy who, you know, never talks to you. But in the text, Frodo is fascinated by elves in particular. Then he sees the Shire in flames and Sam and the other hobbits enslaved marching toward the old mill that has now been replaced with this polluting machinery. So Peter Jackson included this imagery to incorporate the scouring of the Shire, chapter from the Return of the King section of the novel, which was otherwise omitted from this film adaptation altogether. This is a part of the story in which Saruman's forces occupy the Shire and the hobbits have to rid Saruman's forces in the Battle of Bywater. It's really an important chapter in the text because just when you think it's all over, nope. Just like in real war, the darkness digs its roots deep and burns all you hold dear. It's a classic anticlimax, like Odysseus having to scour his home of Penelope's suitors because all true homecomings must be earned. Galadriel warns that one member of the Fellowship will take the ring and betray them. And so Frodo offers it to her freely here. And Galadriel goes crazy. Then please. 
place of a dark lord, you would have a queen! Not dark, but beautiful and terrible as the dawn! Oh, All shall love me and despair! So Peter Jackson derived this monstrous transformation from one word, really, in Tolkien's passage of this moment. She stood before Frodo, seemingly now tall beyond measurement and beautiful beyond enduring, terrible and worshipful. That word being seeming, because it's in Frodo's mind, really. He sees that even the purest of leaders can be turned monstrous. And she even considers the dawn to be terrible in her words. I just love this idea that this darkness is always inside of Galadriel. And she says that to be a ring bearer of a ring of power is to be be alone. Meanwhile, Saruman unleashes Lurtz, telling him the orc's history as former elves that were corrupted by dark forces, but now perfected, and he sends them out marked with the white hand of Saruman on their faces. Celeborn equips the Fellowship with their cloaks and Limbas, the bread, which the extended edition scene goes into a bit. Elvish way bread. One small bite is enough to fill the stomach of a grown man. How many did you eat? Four. Yeah, this is why it's such a big deal in Return of the King when Gollum tosses the bread over the cliff. That was several weeks worth of food and Merry and Pippin's butts are about to explode. Galadriel has given Legolas the bow of Galadrim and Merry and Pippin the daggers of Noldorin. The term Noldoli was actually used in Tolkien's The Book of Lost Tales to describe the race of elves who would become the Noldor, which is the race that Galadriel is. Sam is gifted the elven rope, which he'll use in two towers to scale down the side of the cliff. And this rope unknots itself after Sam tugs it when Sam thought there would be no way of retrieving it. So this rope is that good. Gimli receives, we learn later, three strands of Galadriel's hair, which is really important considering the history from the Cimmerillion. The elf lord Fanor also requested from Galadriel a single strand of her hair to craft the Cimmerils. Those were the gems that contained the godly light to the trees of Valinor, the jewels that the wars of the first stage were fought over. So this gift shows that Galadriel sees in Gimli a chance to mend this feud between elves and dwarves, and truly, this gift is the beginning of the personal fellowship between Gimli and Legolas that never gets questioned from here forward. They love each other now. Galadriel tells Aragorn that two paths are ahead of him. To rise above the height of all your fathers since the days of Elendil, or to fall into darkness with all that is left of your kin. And I love how Galadriel's face fills with light on Ellen Deal, but then goes into shadow when she alludes to what's left of modern men. And speaking of light, Galadriel gives light to Frodo. I give you the light of Elendil our most beloved star. May it be a light for you in dark places when all other lights go out. Erendil is the half-elf mariner who had voyaged to Valinor and had carried a star across the sky at the end of the First Age. He was the father to Elros, who was the first king of the Numenor Island Kingdom. And this file of Galadriel, as it's known in the text, contains the light of the two trees as well and will help Frodo against the spider Shiloh in Return of the King. So they take the river down past the Argonoth statues, and these are Awesome! These depict the likenesses of Isildur and his brother Anarion, who are the sons of Elendil. We saw Elendil and Isildur in the prologue sequence. These statues are designed to warn all invaders into Gondor. Now it's clear most of these statues' bodies were carved out of the cliffside, but from their arms upwards, you can see terraced lines in the statues showing where additional blocks were constructed upward above the cliff line to make the statues taller. Just really cool attention to detail in the design there. So the Fellowship makes camp, and Frodo wanders into Boromir, who's collecting firewood. And in this moment, the ring brings out the worst we've seen yet in Boromir. He shouts, Give it to me! No! Give it to me! No! You can hear Sauron's voice growling under Boromir's voice. Frodo is able to escape by putting the ring on, and he screams after him. I see your mind. You will take the ring to Sauron. You will betray us. And then, just as quickly as the evil left Bilbo when he snapped, Boromir comes to his senses, and guilt overcomes him. What have I done? Now, atop this hill, Frodo actually sees Barad-dûr closer and the eye of Sauron atop it watching him. It's not just the ring, though. It's where Frodo physically is in this moment. This hill is Amon-Hin, the Hill of Sight, or the Hill of the Eye, and it's a border fortress for Gondor with kind of a telescopic view of Mordor to the south. It would make sense that he would be able to see Barad-dûr from here. So the Uruk-hai arrive and the Fellowship goes to town. Legolas fires an arrow, skewering two Uruk-hai, and then uses an arrow to jab another one in the face before shooting that same arrow at the guy behind him. Merry and Pippin lure the uruk away from Frodo. Merry just sensing that Frodo needs to leave, and Boromir comes in to save them. He blows the horn of Gondor, which leads to this incredible tracking shot 
down the hill. This lasts nearly 20 seconds as Jackson's rigging glides the camera down a cable, following Aragorn and Legolas sprinting down and the Uruk High charging toward Boromir. And it ends with this great overhead angle of Boromir. It's just so goddamn cool. And it gives us, again, some great scenic geography that action movies don't usually take the time to do. Lurt flies an arrow directly into Boromir's chest, but Boromir keeps fighting. <laughs> The choir music is actually in the language of Elvish, and the lyrics translate to this. I do not love the sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I only love for what they can defend. And in Tolkien's text, these words are actually spoken by Boromir's younger brother, Faramir. Before Lurtz can strike Boromir down with the final blow, Aragorn tackles him and they come to blows. Lurtz licks the blood off the blade and then chucks it at Aragorn, who deflects it. Viggo Mortensen actually did this stunt with a prop blade and he pulled it off on the first take. So Aragorn stabs Lurtz and Lurtz pulls the sword deeper into his chest just to glare at Aragorn. And Aragorn is like, I'm tired of looking at these eyes and lops the head off. In his dying breaths, Boromir fears that he failed the fellowship, that darkness will overtake his city. But Aragorn reassures them saying, I do not know what strength is in my blood, but... I swear to you, I will not let the White City fall. Nor our people fail. And Boromir questions, did I just hear that right? Our people? And then says, our people. Fates become fate. And Boromir says, I would have followed you, my brother, my captain, my king. And with these words, the king is ready to return. Meanwhile, Frodo hesitates at the shore, but the comforting words of Gandalf return to him. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. Sam chases him into the river, and apparently Sean Astin seriously cut his foot on a sharp rock in this river. Aragorn, you'll notice, straps on Boromir's bracers, and he wears these on his arms from now on through the rest of the trilogy to honor his fallen brother. Gimli says, The fellowship has failed. What if we hold true to each other? While Frodo and Sam's friendship, you could say, comes naturally to them as hobbits from the Shire, so that we still hear Howard Shore's Shire theme as they venture toward Mordor in the final shot, this fellowship back here, among man, elf, and dwarf, is truly the more miraculous victory from this first installment. And it is the most recent for hope in the fights ahead. It's what keeps us singing. You'll notice throughout this analysis, I've taken some crazy steps to look at every song that Jackson included in this movie. And book readers know how much of a slog it can be to read all of Tolkien's lyrics, but it really was music that shaped this world. It was the song of the Ainur that vibrated the grains of the earth and echoes now in the waters. Waters that thundered down the Brynin and trampled the Nazgul. Waters that drowned the Sealder, that hid the ring for years. Waters through which Frodo reached down to grab his friend. Waters that carried Boromir to his final rest. And there's music in all of it. And it trickled down into the ballads, into the laments, into the drinking songs of these folks. Music propels this movie forward with leitmotifs from Howard Shore. And every time you rewatch this movie, every holiday season, tune your ears to this music because in that music we hear the message from the gods that was always there all creations share fellowship and that fellowship is so powerful that death and distance cannot snuff it rings may be forged to divide us but our god-given fellowship will always bring us back together and thus concludes ooh, part one of this lord of the rings analysis on the deep dive channel next of course will be the two towers as you can see these are super in depth and i am so grateful to our editors devin cleary aaron carrion tanner digirolamo and the full new rockstars post-production team for their hard work on these videos and you know what thanks to all of you you viewers for your patience because these movies mean a lot to all of us and we just do not want to rush these videos. So please subscribe to the Deep Dive channel, share these analyses with your fellowship, and be sure to check out some of our other film analyses if you haven't already, like our Deep Dive of The Thing in Interstellar. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye.